ice bowl is dead. <laughs> Rest in peace. It's a Thursday episode. <laughs> Are you okay? We got Doug Minkavich on the podcast today. <laughs> Dallas Braden. Dallas Braden appears to be under the influence of illegal substances. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you appear to be under the influence of puberty. Uh, you all right? Me? Yeah, I feel uh, fine. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I loved your your entrance. Is great. It was great. Yeah, I say I say the same thing every time. <laughs> I know this one had a little more inflection behind it. That's all. Just I'm excited. Cut. I'm excited okay. for the show today. All right, we're coming off the episode of the year. People are calling it. Let's go. I'm yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> people are calling it the episode of the year. Oh, we had a special guest in the house. We had three special guests yesterday. We only have one today. Well, maybe I don't know. I uh, maybe you know. Do you think? Do you think if I asked Boog to come on, if he would come on? <laughs> I think yeah, yeah. You want me to? Uh, here, I'm I'll... talking to him right now. Oh, but I, let, me, let yeah. me see. Yeah, tell tell him. Yeah, tell him we're on the recording. Tell him I'd love to talk to him about the uh, as uh, you know from one announcer to another. I'd like to talk to him about holding a broadcast of. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I all right. I'm gonna if you haven't <laughs> the the ask is out. <laughs> I, I just asked him uh, if he will. Um. All I know is is that based on the response from social media this morning, if you if you achieve something then you're allowed to do anything and everything that you want. And the only solution is that you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have allowed them to accomplish that in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> there is no, there's no limit to what you're allowed to do. If, if you, oh, you want to deny him his moment? Yeah. You want to <laughs> deny him. Uh, Give him his golly. flowers, Jay. Hey, you hateful if, bitch. If you're missing the full context here. Um, what happened was Ronald Acuna Jr. Stole his 70th base last Woo. night against the Cubs. Um, took the bag out of the ground, which was awesome. It was an awesome moment. First player ever. 40 home runs, 70 stolen bases. And uh, the Braves paused the game to show a highlight package. <laughs> uh, and just, just for uh, full context here, it <laughs> yeah. was a 5-5 ball game. Time game. Tie game and Ronnie's on second. <laughs> uh, runner on second base, bottom Ronnie, of the 10th inning. Ronnie, Ronnie's on second. Oh, yeah, he just stole it the for the 70th fucking tie. One <laughs> of the fastest runners in the game uh, is in scoring position in the bottom of the 10th inning. And the Cubs are trying to inch into the postseason in game Fighting. 158 of 162. Fighting for October. <laughs> Here is. Here's the Cubs broadcast. Then we're really stopping the game. Can we get the can we get the can we get the base after the game? I mean, this is <laughs> we're gonna need it. This is pretty <laughs> absurd. I mean, it, it's just a hell of an accomplishment. Totally, but you but, can't stop the game yeah, and want a yeah, highlight yeah. montage. <laughs> You can't. <laughs> you can't. I guess you're wrong, yeah, Boog. Actually. You're fucking wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, damn. Not only can they, they will. Put your feet up. Enjoy you some Ronnie. Enjoy you some Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie, they, this is your life. <laughs> what if you they go. just reeled off every fucking stolen base and every homer? Oh, just like just like a, a, a video package of congratulations. <laughs> Ronald Acuna Jr. from first grade. Here is <laughs> Mrs. Coogan saying congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Ronnie. We always knew you could do it when you were a little kid in first grade. We thought that you were going to be stealing 70 bases someday, and here you are. Yeah, we got Ronnie's We got Ronnie's third grade T-ball coach. Tell us what you thought. Ronnie! Balakaye! <laughs> it's like, what? what, what why not? Mm. Why not? Right? I mean, give the fans what they want. We've That's never it's baseball history. It's baseball history. We've never <laughs> seen 4070 before. You're in Atlanta. You do it at home. One of the last games of the season. Honestly, <laughs> I thought I thought the video the, package should have been longer. The, fa the thought, fact, look, I, I said it, Jared. The fact that they didn't 
have him jump in the bullpen cart and tour around the warning track <laughs> in the field yes. to high five fans and take mm-hmm. pictures and share in that moment. That's what you were talking about robbing fans of a mo the fact that Blooper didn't somehow end up on second base with Ronnie and they weren't <laughs> yeah. ziplining together. Yeah. Like the fact that we're missing out on all of that. I mean, look, great montage. Right. Absolutely fitting for the moment. It felt half assed to me. <laughs> yeah, it did. I feel like we were robbing. Listen, if you don't if you don't want Outcast coming onto the forum <laughs> yeah. to uh, onto the field to perform <laughs> mid inning, right. then you shouldn't have let Ronnie steal the base. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Here's Usher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They should I know it would have taken like a few minutes to clean it up, but the fact that there was no explosion of confetti falling from the sky. Yeah, right. No uh, balloon drop? They, what the fuck? Yeah. Flyover. Yeah. They should have done a flyover. <laughs> One of those flyovers where like a guy descends out of the plane, right? And then it's Maybe he crashes into the stands. Yeah, no, it would have been good. I think I think you're right that they did underplay it. They did. <laughs> yeah. They half assed it. And I think, you know, it's it's just it's kind of lazy when you think about it because obviously you knew it was coming. It's not it's not an achievement. It's not like a four home run game where it's like, well, how the hell were we supposed to know that that happened? Um <laughs> you, you, you want to know this this is seriously, it makes me feel like whoever put the montage together was for whatever reason allowed to be a little too close to the button like for go time right <laughs> and they had no context of the situation they're like and he stole it hit the button it's go it's go it's go time woo, woo. and they're like dude it's the fucking bottom of the tent somebody on social brought up mark mcguire hitting his 62nd and i was like that happened in the fourth inning <laughs> <laughs> and by definition nobody was on base after that right like they it's Yo, yo. Boog. Boog. Hang on one second. <laughs> Let me uh, hang on one second. Let me just get, I'm going to get rid of this call. Hang on. Okay. What up? There he is. How we doing? Uh, it's me. <laughs> Dallas is here. Jay Hayes here. Joey's here. I, the whole oh game is here. The whole game's here. I love this. Yeah. We were just talking about <laughs> how like the Braves didn't do enough. Like, where was the musical performance? Where right. was the Lord. confetti? Uh, right. There should have been a flyover. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the fact that the fact that Blooper didn't make it out on the field, Dallas even had the idea yeah. of the bullpen cart. Like, Carl, Carl Yastrzemski got to run a yeah. full lap around the entire ballpark at Fenway for his last game. And, oh, wow, okay, you retired. So many people retire. Only one person has done 4070. The celebration felt half assed to me. I don't know where you fall on it. Totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they should have they should have exploded the bullpen cart. I don't I mean, look, I don't want I, Twitter is amazing. I, I I didn't even really I, my Twitter got hacked, so I've been uh I've been a Twitter slacker mm. for a few weeks now, but I had some people send me some stuff like Look, anybody that's heard me and JD, we are not the get off my lawn guy. Mm-hmm. Now, for last night, I was just like, "What? We're stopping the it's five five in the tenth. Like, what are we? <laughs> we're we're gonna play highlights? Like, what are we doing?" So, I don't know. It just seemed like it. It just seemed a little much. And then, like, look, the guys had an amazing season, but I hate to. 40 is not a thing like in six years no one's gonna be like has anybody ever gone 40 70 like they're gonna say he won the mvp and had a really good year but like i mean they might as well just run like highlights from the 91 world series up there like who, what are you doing is do- anyway doesn't that make it all the more the 40 70 all the more impressive is like we can't even really comprehend it because if it let's just say hypothetically he uh, was chasing 40 40 and it's we've got four games left and he stole his right. 40th base and it's like yeah another member of the 40 40 club because 40 40 is a thing 40 70 is not a thing because no one's ever done it like I feel like that's it makes it more impressive that we can't even comprehend how crazy that is yeah I mean I yes I, I would say um, it's he's he's an amazing talent um, but I also feel like you know when when Ricky when Ricky pulled the <laughs> the bag out of the ground, yeah. 
you know, like that was a, a little bigger moment than this one. You know what I mean? Like that's that, that like yeah, nine thirty nine bigger the greatest for base, greatest base dealer of all time. So I the I mean, look, I it's just funny where and then you know people saying like we were really bent out of shit. I mean, whatever. I don't do I care? No. Do I really care? No, but you want, but like, ask me my opinion. Like, yes, I think it's stupid that we're stopping the game and playing highlights. Like, do I care? Do I want anyone to get hit? No, but like, whatever. Uh, Can you take us like into the booth? Like, are you just kind of looking at each other and being like, what the fuck is going on right now? (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what, that's exactly what I was looking at him. He's looking at me. I'm like, wait, why is the game stopping? What are we doing? <laughs> and then, yeah, it was just, anyway. So, so, so Boog, um, Boog, Boog, you, you have been, you have been somebody who I have looked to for guidance. You have been somebody, I, I have been fortunate <laughs> enough to work with you at the very beginning of, uh, of this yeah. gig here. And you have helped me a tremendous amount. And once again, I'm going to go to you for guidance here. I need to know how to react in that situation, if I see somebody, if I see a 4070 unfold on my watch, how do I prepare for that montage moment? Do I become part of the montage? Do I lay out? Do I let it breathe? Because I feel like you and JD, I mean, you have continued to supply Cubs fans with incredible takes, incredible moments, and and you have framed yeah. them wonderfully. I need to know, though, how to prepare for my 4070 moment for your 4070. I, I, I think, look, I, the thing I would say that's always just a good place to go lay out. That's like a, the one thing I always tell when I work with a new producer, I tell them nobody lays out like me. I should have just laid out and just, we should have just gone tight on the scoreboard. And then basically all of the Cubs fans would have stormed the booth and thrown us out mm. on the field at Turner yes. for a Truist Park. Yeah. yeah. How would you how would you rate the montage though? Was it a good edit at least? Yeah, decent, decent. I'm a good so montage I, guy. I, I couldn't. I, I was like, wait, what are we? Re-? I mean, like sound full highlights. It wasn't even like good highlights. <laughs> it was sound full highlights. <laughs> yes. it was. It was wild. I mean, it was. You're, so like, it's it's five five in the tenth. And the Cubs are trying like to make the wild card, and it's like, and there's number twenty five for Acuna yeah. on the jump. And I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. Anyway, uh, are you so, a res- are you a wrestling fan, Boog? Um, I, I I got I mean I as a kid I very much so not now, but I'm not like anti wrestling. Okay, so uh, my question was going to be like, where would you rank this in the pantheon of montages? Like, I think. The, the Rocky montage, all-time classic. And then I don't know if this reference means anything to you, but uh, the Stone Cold versus The Rock montage going sure. into WrestleMania 17. A lot of people say that's yep. one of the best montages of all time. Where does the Acuna 4070 montage rank in terms of your life experience montages? Now, like, just to be clear, when you talk Rocky montage, you're talking about Rocky one, or are you talking about Rocky four when he climbs the mountain Rocky by four. himself? Four, Rocky right? Four, yes, of course you are. Yeah. Um, I, I would say it, it, it's somewhere probably just below that, but uh, yeah, just below, just below the Rocky four montage <laughs> in that in that general range so god yeah yeah I, I mean we'll sneak back out there today and <laughs> i mean i think that i can't wait to talk to brian snicker and be like what did we really need to do that although he was he had been ejected earlier in the game how about that do you i mean he got ejected you don't see you don't see umpires miss a call. I don't know what you guys saw, how the Cubs got their first run, but it was like a check swing foul that was so foul and all four umpires missed it. And it was called a pass ball. And Snit, I mean, you could hear it and Snit was mad and then they threw him out and it was like, wow, they really missed that call. And then they ejected him because he was angry that they missed the call. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so but last night, Last night, tough loss for the Cubs, but yeah. still clinging to that third wild card spot tied now with the Miami yeah. Marlins of all teams. I would be I, I would probably take the under on mm, 
five and a half times that the Marlins were mentioned on this podcast all year. Yet here all they year. are going into yeah. game 159, I believe, uh, tied for the third wild card spot with the Chicago Cubs. Um, how do you see this thing playing out the rest of the way? I don't know. I mean, they, they finished with the Pirates, and the Pirates have been a pain in the backside. They were to the Reds. I mean, to some extent, they kind of ended the Reds' season, right, mm-hmm. when they that 9 nothing game. Um, you know, I look, I – the one thing that's hard is the Cubs don't have a tiebreaker with anyone. Um, and gosh, if you I mean, you win these two games, they they probably would have had an opportunity uh, at the two spot. Um, although I don't know, you probably if you're the Cubs, you probably would rather play Milwaukee than Philadelphia. But you're just trying to get in. The thing that I and I'm sorry to bring the nerd out, but the part that I just find so amazing. I mean. The Marlins are 82 and 76. It's the same record as the Cubs, and they're minus 58. 58. So the gap in terms of run differential between mm-hmm. these two teams is 157 runs, <laughs> and they have the same record. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. Like, that does not happen in other sports. Um, that, that is just, that is wild. So, what do I think is going to happen? I think that the Cubs. I think the Cubs will win tonight. If the Cubs go four and zero, oh, they will make the playoffs. Is is the thing I feel strongly about. Anything less than that, and I think it gets a little dicey. Is my is my take? But I expect them to win tonight, and I expect them to win at least two of three. I don't know if they'll win three of three at the Okay. All right. Boog That's Shabby. what I got. One of the voices of the Chicago Cubs. Uh, is there any? Uh, is there any ALC, uh, ALCS, a- ALS uh, Foundation that we can point our listeners in the direction of? ProjectMainStreet.org. I appreciate that so much, you guys. Of course. Um, yeah, Project Main Street. It's it's Maine, and then it's ST.org, and uh, every dollar raised goes to help um, someone living with the disease. So. Um, I'm grateful for that. And I look forward to the, uh, the montage you guys put together for this brilliant <laughs> appearance. I just made. It's good. We're going to cook up something good for you. Don't worry about it. I love you guys. All right, Boog. Be good. <laughs> Later, brother. See you, See you Boog. Later. Bye. Oh, he's the best. Boog Shambi. I'm, I'm glad he brought up the, uh, the check swing thing because my favorite response on social media today in response to the, you know, the Acuna celebration going too far was I didn't see them complaining when they got that free run. I was like, what does that have to do? with? (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Anyways, uh, things are heating up at the ballpark. Every team is playing to finish the season strong and make it to the playoffs. Just like the Cubs. Uh, There's a DraftKings sports book right at uh, Wrigley field. It's a, it's connected to the ballpark. With DraftKings Sportsbook, you won't miss a moment of uh, the baseball action. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on baseball. Plus, all customers can take a crack at a sweet payday with DraftKings Same Game Parlay. String together multiple bets from a single game for your shot at a major payout. So what are you waiting for? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code JARED. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on baseball. Only on the DraftKings Sportsbook with the promo code Jared, J-A-R-E-D. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after insurance. Opt-in and 10 plus leg requirement for 100% boost. Eligibility, wagering, and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash baseball terms. Um, The end of the season is basically upon us, gentlemen. Uh, We are going into the final weekend on Sunday. By Sunday, this season will have seen its final regular season game. Uh, And I I don't know how I feel about that because... it's it's a it's always bittersweet when you have the end of a regular season, 
it's like, all right, you know, the we've we've come this far. We've done this many podcasts, but you're it's signaling the end, but it's also signaling the beginning of the postseason. Well, Jared, of which we're very excited for a wise young woman once said, we have not come this far just to come this far. Mm. <clears throat> Who is that woman, by the way? Uh, I believe that was Kim Kardashian. Ah, got yes. it. Uh, actually, before one of the greatest on, Joseph, do, oral do you have any, we've I, seen in our you time. need to defend the brave side of this narrative. I mean, I feel like <clears throat> we, and we feel like we, we did a pretty good job taking the brave side on the issue. But how do you how do you feel about the montage in the situation? No, I agree with Boog, man. Forty seventies, like shit happens all the time. Not really big deal. <laughs> Joey, just seven. Why you got to be a little baby back bitch? Why didn't you jump in right there and yeah, let him know? Like Boog, something bro, is right there. nobody has done this, and you're just kind of poo pooing it like you don't want to see videos of it. I thought you were gonna stand up for your boy, for Ronnie. Nothing yeah. out of you. It's a tough look, Joe. I was waiting for someone to throw it at me. You know, no hey, one. Th- no, it's a, it's a it's a dog fight. It's a right. dog fight. You get in there. <laughs> Next time. Okay, give, I, me his number. give me his fucking number. Yeah, you want me to call him back right now? Be like, hey, bro, right, all right. Actually, Next year when Ronnie goes 40 80, you better yeah. be all over him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was your what was your take when you heard the clip, Joe? Or, I mean, are you I mean, uh, yeah, the clip because you wouldn't have been watching the Cubs broadcast. Of the I don't fucking know. I wasn't there. I didn't see the montage. You know, I don't know if the montage was too long. 40 70 seems dope to me. Like couple couple sec i heard on twitter it was just like a mound visit that's how long it took that's what i you know so obviously i'm gonna have my boys back oh you, you know what i just um, thought about this what was this uh remember these moments have to be scheduled and they have to be planned for by the organization and they have to be approved by the umpiring crew mm-hmm. so this wasn't just the Braves, or it, I don't think it could have been just the Braves hijacking the moment. This is something that I believe that the umpiring crew had to have been made aware of. And if not, then you can say they did a good job of allowing the moment to breathe and allowing the moment to play out. Uh, but remember, if guys were going to be receiving ovations and stuff like that, this was stuff that had to be planned for because. We watched guys get banged for receiving ovations and taking too long, right? We saw it in spring training when Sergio Romo pitched for the Giants. And because he took too long, boom, that's a ball. Well, what the fuck? Definitely. Right. Like, Def- definitely planned. So, I mean, that's. But something- again, dude, brother, this so- is the first time. This is the first time in history. We're setting precedent here, all right? Obviously, now we know we didn't know before. You get forty seventy, you get a montage. Next person to get forty seven, you get a montage. You know what I'm saying? You well, get forty about- sixty, you don't get a montage. Obviously, first montage of all times, forty seventy. Some people think you don't deserve a montage for forty seventy. Um, it was the first time it ever happened, but now we know. Does this just if you get forty seventy, you get a montage? Does this eliminate the forty fifty acknowledgement? Does this eliminate the forty sixty acknowledgement? Now that forty seventy has been achieved and it's been montaged. Like if it's if it's forty fifty, are we saying no montage? Forty sixty, are we saying no montage? It's interesting because I was there for forty forty. I saw it. I saw it land in front of me. There was no montage. Now that was an away park. So I don't know, but all I'm trying to say is, man. Obviously, there's never been a time in history. I don't see how you can p- complain about a montage for forty seventy when literally. There's never been 4070 and not been a montage. Well, it's just a, it's a the the tie you know I mean? ga- the tie game. Uh, but there's why never don't ha- you play the montage <laughs> after the game? Because people got to go home, traffic. Nah, they don't have to uh, go. Listen, shit. we don't. They don't have to well, and, and if, it's, be, if, it's, a loss, if it's that big of a here. moment, they can carve out an extra five minutes after the game, right? Mm. If it's a loss, that oh, falls it's, five, five it's bigger ten. than that. It's bigger than that. There's Maybe never been a 47. When listen, when you fucking the guy gets on the moon for the first time, he gets to say whatever he fucking wants. Now, you know what I'm trying to say? They I don't know do how much f- they. I don't know <laughs> the how long they gave the first, first guy on the moon. Yeah, I th- as far as I know, he got one sentence. One small step for man, one giant step for mankind. Now we know man, when he touched like the moon, it was worth of talking. 
It, it, was, a no, it was a giant leap. When you touch when you touch the moon, you get one fucking cool sentence to say. You don't get two, but you get one. Now you get 4070, you get to get a montage. First person gets to do it, they're setting president. You can't complain about it because you're the first. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah, I'm out. Ty Gang, 10th love- inning Cubs fighting for the postseason. Every response is ignoring the idea of the leverage moment in the game. Yeah. Like, I don't understand how people don't get that celebrating something in the fourth inning or like when Cal Ripken broke the consecutive game streak. Do you know when that happened? Mm. It was like right after the game became official. It was the middle of the game. Like, yes, that took a lot longer, but it's pretending like it, the fact that it was five to five in the 10th game was over, is, brother. It isn't a significant Ronnie's factor on second in this discussion base. is crazy. No, Ronnie well, on second crazy. base, game-winning run with Ozzy up, game's over already. I mean, that's my argument. No, I'm with the, I'm with the Cubs fans. I understand. Just bad video drop. Bad video. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't want to be mean to the Cubs fans. They deserve some sympathy. The fact of the matter is, these last two games for the Cubs might have been the most painful two games ever. That was a slap in the face to not only like fuck up, you know, you go into Atlanta, you're like, we got to win these games. You make an error to lose the first game. Now you're out. Now you're struggling. Now they come at the game. You blow a game. You blow the lead in the ninth inning. And then in the 10th, they play a montage on your ass. You get montage right before it's over and then walked off. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like that finish him moment in Mortal Kombat. You're just fucking standing there. Your character's just, you can't do anything. Throw your controller. It's over. Fatality. Done. I mean, that's, that's at the point. You got to, res- if you're a Cubs fan, you got to look at the Braves. I respect it. I mean, we got Tip little cap. Broad. You got, yeah, you yeah. got little Broad every step of the way. Yeah. There's not one, you got, you got big boys. It's a bad, yes. There's levels to this shit, Boog. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Interesting. Anyways, this weekend, uh, some interesting matchups here. You got Tampa and Toronto finishing it out against each other. Um, hmm, you got the Twins A's. The, Twins A's getting ready Twins to kick A's off here. Twins A's is huge. Yep. yep. Rangers Mariners. That one feels. That one feels pretty big. <clears throat> that one feels big. Cubs still playing for their playoff lives against the Milwaukee Brewers, who already clinched the division. Uh, the Miami Marlins playing for their playoff lives against the Pittsburgh Pirates, as Boog mentioned. So, yeah, <clears throat> still reasons to tune in. I mean, uh, the Rangers and Mariners, that is going to be uh, it's going to be a dog I, fight. I told you the AL West. Come on. Here we are. Appointment television. Well, I mean, let's let's do a little standings update here. It's you three. I mean, if it's three, does it take any of the juice out of Rangers Mariners that the Rangers are like basically locks now? Kinda. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Like I know well, it still has like significant they're... impact for Mariners and and Astros, but I don't know. Well, I was sort of geared up for like it, it being like an all in thing for both teams. Yeah, but I mean, what what are the? Uh, I mean. Yeah, I mean a what? little of the shine. Well, no, I was gonna say a little of the shine, but I mean, th- come on, Seattle, Houston. Is it like you're saying that doesn't do. No, 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 no. It's it's not that like they're being team. Th- I like that there's something left to be decided, but it does. In my mind, when we were talking about this earlier in the week, it was going to be decisive for both teams, and mm-hmm. it's just not in that way anymore. Like the Rangers have a cushion. To their, I mean, to their credit, congratulations about that. But like, it's as a neutral fan, I, you know, uh, it doesn't have quite the stakes for the Rangers that I thought it would. That's all. I think the the Cubs Marlins dynamic is more interesting than the AL West. I do. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. At this point, uh, if you look at the <clears throat> playoff chances right now, the Seattle Mariners have fallen to twenty seven point six percent playoff odds. 27.6 Houston at 83.2 uh my Texas Rangers at 99.1 uh and then down here in the National League 
the Chicago Cubs. I mean, 10 of the 12 teams are in, basically. Yeah. You've now fallen to 29.4% for the Cubs and 692 for the Fish. <laughs> hmm. The Miami Marlins, they're going back to the playoffs, it sounds like. I don't know. Yes. Does anyone disagree? Anyone disagree? Anyone get the... <laughs> They will get the Marlins not making it in right now. Where are they at? They're tied for the third wild card spot with the Cubs, but the Cubs hold no tiebreakers, as Boog mentioned. So oh my good. So they're tied. They're tied with yeah. And the Marlins have three. They both have four games left. Yeah. Yes, and. There, the odds are that way in part because of the tiebreaker and in part because the Cubs schedule is considered substantially harder <sighs> over these four games. The Cubs are going to have to play Atlanta tonight, and we've seen how that's gone. All right. Atlanta has slapped them in the face in the worst way possible, arguably without even trying. I mean, there's nothing. To I play don't know. For they for had the to, Braves. They had to like. You know, kind of uh, destroy the fabric of the game last night to get that win. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, kind of break Bla- precedent. That's called gamesmanship. You're allowed to do Fair that enough. when you set records, and um, this is a team that's setting records. But the Cubs, the vibes with the Cubs right now is that this is a sinking ship, mm. and. When you're talking about stuff like that, ship sinking, what does better in the sea? Marlins or Bears? Because this ship is sinking, guys. I mean, after the Seiya Suzuki error, and I think that one hurt more than anything just because you go against Atlanta, the best team in the league, in a series you have to win, and to choke it like that is worse than anything. And then the next day to get montaged, as I've already said, that's tough and then you're gonna have to play the Braves again when the Marlins seem like they got nothing to lose they're just saying fuck it no one's paying attention to us anyway we just gotta play the, the stupid Mets and the Pirates who Boog says are good but let's be honest Joey I'm not sure if you've ever heard of a polar bear uh pretty elite when it comes to the sea mm. I'm not sure if you've seen a grizzly in action right around the mouth of a, a river slash Mm. Bay, brackish wow. water, pretty elite there as well. Just ask a salmon. Um, Have you seen so the fucking bears can hold their own in the, the sea? Cubs? Joseph, have is you all seen I'm the mascot at. for the? Those aren't the type of bears that we're talking about here. <laughs> all just, right, just letting we're you know. Talking about a black bear, about the size of your dog. Yeah, they they don't stand that much of a chance. Why, why? Yeah, the cub. A sinking ship? What, because they've lost a couple games in a row? It's the way they did it. It's the way they lost. I think it's absolutely a fair characterization, to be honest with you. (laughs) Their playoff odds have plummeted over the last two weeks, and the the specific way that they've lost the last Mm -hmm. two games is heartbreaking. I have plenty of friends in Chicago, and I've heard words like, I'm pissed I got sucked in. Like there's some real in your emotion stuff going on with Cubs fans, I think right now, because it had the feeling of like an unexpected good ride for a long time, because I don't think expectations were super high, and then they got pretty high, and I think, um, I think this would be a pretty devastating turn of events if they did and, not make the playoffs rel- and lost it to the Marlins. Well, look, nobody and it's had, not yeah. even it's not even this series. It's the last two weeks they got swept by the Dodgers. That's what I said twice yeah. in two weeks. Yeah, they've gone and from like t- eighty one. They've gone, sorry, before that D-back series, it was 81% to make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I remember it because I looked multiple times. And they're at, what, 28 now? Like, that's a, that is a collapse. This is a team, Jared, that wouldn't be surprised to see in the World Series. Okay? And now I, they're about to get, get knocked out by the damn fish, guys. I, well, and Jared posed the question like a week or two ago, like, of the, of the AL West teams, like, if... If you're the team that doesn't make it, is it considered a collapse or what's your level of disappointment? It, it looks like it might be the, Mar- uh, the Mariners, and I think that would be disappointing. But I think the team that actually gets like into the collapse conversation Cubs. is the Cubs. Um, they have played really, really poorly down the stretch. And I don't think it's going to be you know, a legendary collapse. 
Is there uh, is there anything to them playing? It has Milwaukee? to be the most disappointing turn of events for any team that had a real playoff shot in the second half this year. Is there anything to them playing Milwaukee here? Uh, the, this final series in Milwaukee, you know, being locked in and maybe looking to rest some guy. I don't know. Is there anything? Maybe. Yeah. Is there sure. anything that allows the Milwaukee Brewers or the Chicago Cubs an opportunity to to win three out of the next four? I mean, I think it's totally fair to look at the next four games, the one against the Braves and the three against the Brewers, and hope that you're not getting the full throttle versions of those teams. Like, I know who it's uh, Smith Shaver on the bump tonight for the Braves. Like, well, how about this? Does 500 keep seven the Cubs? homers? Does 500 last keep the Cubs starts? where they're at? No, no, no. I think Boog's correct that they probably need, they may need to win out. And I don't think 500 gets them where they're going to go. Um, or where they need to be, but because then, because then the fish only have to win, you know what, two of four, uh, as well. Because they, I, I don't know, man. I think the Cubs have put themselves in a really difficult spot. But if you want to hope that the Brewers are tossing out, you know, schmoes at the end at the end of the season, then well, they probably will. They probably got to they got to save their guys for the wild card game. They yeah, still got to win those games, though, right? The Brewers? Why well, no, no, Brewers? no, the Cubs. The Cubs do, but the Cubs aren't going to be facing. Uh, the uh, Burns, Peralta, Woodruff. or um, Woodruff. So that helps. And also, For sure. I know we're well, shitting on the Cubs because they, des- the they deserve like, it. Uh, yeah, well, I, playing I thought I answered the question. I think it's fine to hope that that's the case, but you still have to win the games. Like they, st- Even if they're going against diminished versions of those teams, you still need to win probably at least three of the next four games. Well, I mean, who knows? But one, how much faith do you have in the fish? It's one thing to say the diminished fish. versions, but if, I mean, we're, 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 we're talking about the Brewers being the potential force that they could be in the postseason, why? Because of their starting pitching. And exactly. if you're just not going to see any one of the three heads of that monster, then that's got to give you a pretty good feeling, considering that's why they have a chance in the postseason tournament, is because of the guys you're not going to see. So if that's the case, yeah, well, okay, now I'm, now I'm a little more interested. Now I'm a little more intrigued. Now that it does become maybe a little more possibility. But let me let me let me throw out a uh, a counter to that. Do you think the Pirates are throwing their best players <laughs> necessarily in some of those games? Uh, Mitch Keller is not going to be able to against pitch the Marlins. The, this down the he just pitched, so he's probably um, right, yeah, but, right, uh, right. So Mitch Keller's done, yeah. <laughs> and I think we will struggle to name another. Uh, we shut down. Well, no, we shut down Paul Skeens, so he's uh, fuck. We, yeah. Right, yeah. not with the big league yeah. club yet. Yep, no. yep, yep. So, and I think, you traded Rich. I Hill. think it's fair to say that my <laughs> Miami may not be facing a murderer. Right now, it's uh, Quinn Priester. On I'm the bump not telling for the you they're going to see Saturday. a ton of resistance, Jay. Hey, jeez. I'm and just uh, it's a TV. It's a TBD starter on Friday. And uh-huh. let's see who's on Sunday. I wonder if we've heard of this person before. That's going to be yeah. That bitch dealing is what TBD stands for. Oh, that it's bitch ESPN has <laughs> Mitch Keller, so we know that's not true. Oh, there you we go. That's not true. Yeah. Oh, he's gonna is he he's gonna make it? Yeah, Mitch or Keller is gonna uh, he's gonna line up for that start on Sunday, uh, and he is. I think he's a free agent, isn't he? After the season, I d- uh, yeah, I didn't know if he was Mitch gonna Keller. Make that, uh, I didn't know if he was gonna make. Is he that not last starter? I don't think so. Do I, am I totally off about that? What? Totally off about what? I don't think. I thought his free agency totally was coming what? up. Maybe it's not till the following season. Who? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Who are you Listen, as, shitty, as shitty as the Pirates are, I don't think anyone would be surprised if they rip off a few wins against the freaking Marlins. Come on. Especially if all if all fucking Mitchie Punchouts is going to be taking the ball, you can't just be given the same nickname for five different dudes. Mickey Punchouts, Mickey Punchouts. He has two years of control remaining. Mitch Keller is that who you guys are talking about? The free yes. agent thing? No, he has yes, yes, two years. No, I was wrong. Yeah, I was arm. wrong. Yeah, yeah, two more years of control. Yeah, which is why Mitchie Punchouts, you know. Mitchie like punch outs and fucking Bobby Mitchie punch outs out. and fucking <laughs> well, Polly punch outs and mm-hmm. Polly punch, punch outs. Polly punch out. I mean, fucking check the tape on Polly punch out. You can, you no, can we scoff know. all you want. You can make fun. I, I'm not gonna watch. I'm not watching that tape. Fuck that. All you uh, want. Watch no, the tape. I, I just remember when the pod was delayed to start because you were looking up Brent Rooker's stats. 
This dude's got yeah. 30 homers or whatever. <laughs> yeah. The fuck was that all about, dude? Look, you oh, guys know me. Go to get Brent Rooker in a big, 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 big Trento. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is Paul uh, Blackburn I'm, will finish this year with uh, more punch outs than he's ever accumulated. Whatever, ever. Whatever, dude. So, Polly Punch wow. Out. Well, as Doug yeah. Minkiewicz said, you Pauly know, Punch Out. At the, yep, the strikeouts are just accepted now. So, much less impressive than it would have been, I guess. Well, Sad for Polly Punch, Polly Punch himself. <laughs> nope. It's Polly, it's Polly Punch Out. That's not. You fucking. Uh, all right, guys. The summer may be over, but the sun is still shining, and you need a great pair of shades that you don't have to baby. Knock around sunglasses is the go to for quality polarized shades that won't break the bank. Plus, they just released their first set of teams in their official MLB collection, including Red Sox and Yankees. Don't be the guy that's squinting into the sun or worried about messing up your expensive shades. Playoffs are right around the corner, and Knock Around will have you looking fresh for all the action. Check out knockaround.com for great looking polarized shades starting at just 28 bucks. Use the promo code ROCKET, and that'll get you free shipping on your order. All right. Uh, we just saw him pop in just moments ago. Here is our sit-down with Doug Minkiewicz. All right, here with Doug Minkiewicz, who's down in Florida right now, enjoying the good life. Uh, we, we've we been accused of not giving the Minnesota Twins enough love. And, you know, the topic of winning in the postseason has become a thing pretty much for the last decade. So I was like, why don't we why don't we go back to the glory days of Minnesota Twins baseball, back with the the days of the baggy and bring back Doug Minkavich because I want to what was it like when the Minnesota Twins were winning playoff games? Can you tell us? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think we knew what we were doing. I mean, like, <laughs> like we were just young and and just and you know Playing a whole the whole contraction thing kind of really bonded us together. Um, we felt like we were the perfect storm. The year before we got off to a great start, I think we were twenty one and three or something, and we just didn't realize how long the year was when we were winning. So you know, you look up and Cleveland had Jim Tome and Manny, and it just was the list goes on and on. And you're like, we can't hold these guys off this long, and uh, we kind of ran out of gas in September. Come to two thousand two, everything clicked. And I think if you look at the team we had, looking back on it now, you're looking at Latroy Hawkins with, you know, 15,000 appearances in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, A.J. Pruszynski, 17-year veteran. Torrey Hunter, to me, is a Hall of Famer. Uh, you know, we had complimentary pieces. Jock Jones, the list goes on. Johan Santana was our middle guy. Yeah. Uh, I still don't – still question that one from, from the start. Um, but uh, Brad Radke, Eric Milton, the list goes on and on. We had a squad that just – we haven't – no one heard about us. We joked around at the time. And O2, we play the A's, and I'm like, this is Fox's worst nightmare. They're going to put us on Fox Family at 9 a.m. because no <laughs> one's going to watch it. So, and if you look back at those teams, I mean, Ray Durham, you know, Eric Chavez, Miguel Tejada, the three headed monster in Hudson, Mulder, and Zito, it just was, you know, just because you haven't heard about us doesn't mean we weren't very good players. <laughs> right. Would you say, would you say the O2 twins were the best team that you played on that didn't win a championship? Oof, that's a tough one. I mean, I think if you'd have kept that team together for another three years, I think we had a legit shot. I mean, we, the funny thing is we never beat Mulder, Hudson, or Zito up until that playoff series. Paul Mulder went to advance scout him, and <clears throat> to say it made it easier is disrespectful to the guys that are on the mound, but they made them seem mortal. And without Paul you know, doing what he did. I mean, I went from, I think I struck out nine straight times against, against Hudson. And ever since Paul kind of scouted him, I had success against them. So, um, you know, I think we keep that team together uh, a few years longer. Um, you never know, but, uh, uh, you know, to say there's a lot, I always feel like there's more great teams that don't win than actually do pull off a world series win. Right. Well, D- Dougie, you got, I mean, look, it's not like you're getting an AB anytime soon, and it's not like either one of those three are taking the bump anytime soon. What in the Sam hell did Polly drop on you boys that had you looking at them like they were no longer heroes, like they, they were actually penetrable? What, what was – because that right there – and, I mean, we can go down so many different alleys because of what you just said. Veteran presence, Paul Molitor, advanced scouting, and it's not necessarily analytics. It's the, the mind's eye, the veteran's eye. That comes and he's doing the work and he drops this on. What the hell did he have? What 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 do I, you got? I always talk about Paul was always we call him Yoda, right? Like we all think we. I thought I was a student of the game. 
And he made me feel like really dumb as far as like <laughs> what I saw and what everybody else saw. And like Paul's was, like I say, it was Yoda. Like he knew exactly. I mean, I'm talking like breaking down counts to um, what, what's a ball, what's his ball to strike ratio and what does he feature? Um, to me, like learning it over the, like going back, Hudson's swing counts were like one, two. Um, like one oh was a guaranteed take sign, a guaranteed take take count. Two one was a guaranteed take count. Um, and it was like their whole philosophy. If you look back, uh, a lot of guys tend to be like that. They they live off your aggression and live off your chase rate. And Tim had enough stuff to where he could just, I mean, basically play with you up there. But I, I almost to the point where like one two was a swing count, uh, which was crazy to think about. Like I know everyone would be two strikes with any one of those guys, but. <laughs> Um, I think I had a slider for a homer off him with one, two, and I didn't swing before that. I'd cha- I So just little intricate things like that. It, it, uh, it was information, but it wasn't information overload. And like, he kept it. Like I always say this about analytics. Everybody has them. It all boils down to who has better players and who can adjust. I look at the kids today and I'm just like, man, I don't know how I couldn't handle all that information. I wouldn't want it. Um, it's too much. So it makes you robotic. I feel, but, uh, the same token. If you know how to take it, and at the time, Paul made it so simple for us to, I mean, anyone could have understood what he was doing. And that, that's it. That's it right there is the transmission of information, being it, having it being able to be relatable, understandable, and not inundating you. And you're looking up going, well, well, what does that mean? I don't have, do I need a calculator for this again? What, right. And you were able to just very simply to one, this is what we're not doing. One, two, this is what I should probably do. Drop the head, slide piece. Thanks for coming. Three left turns. Like that's that's fucking beautiful, man. And you don't Thank, you, thankful oh. for thankful for a day game in Oakland, not a night game, because it'd have been a kind of shit <laughs> at night. <laughs> that's it. F9, Dougie. Nay, nay. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at it this way. I mean, my, I look at back at 99, my first year in the big leagues. I listened to every scouting report to a T. And I hit trying to show the coaches that. I was listening to the scouting report where, and I got my bat jam up my ass sideways. So uh, I, I kind of went back and 01 was like, okay, look, like, I'm going to take the information, but I'm going to apply it to me. And I need to stay off what I do well. And if I do what I do well, I won't have to worry about that. I'm, I'm not coming off my strength until I have to. And I think that me as a manager in the minor leagues with, with the, a lot of the twins guys that are there now is, okay, this is what he does, but what do you do well? Okay, let's stick with what you do well. Understand what he's trying to do to you, but understand I'm looking here. I'm hunting your ass here, and mm. we're going to stay there, and we're going to grind until we have to. Love that. You uh, you mentioned Torrey Hunter as uh, being a Hall of Famer in your mind. Where are you at on Johan Santana's Hall of Fame case? I mean, he he fell off the ballot after one year, which was shocking to me. Like, whether or not he got in, you could have a debate about it, but falling off the ballot after one year was bizarre. I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, I, I go back to I was playing winter ball in Venezuela and Johan was on my team. And I remember Terry Ryan was our GM and he called me one day and he asked me, is there anybody on your team? Because the rule five draft was coming up. And he, he says, is there anybody on your team? I go, look, Terry, I don't know what this guy's throwing, but no one hits it. I mean, no <laughs> one. And I was like, you know what? Like, because, you know, like, OK, as a left handed hitter, I was like, how good can a changeup really be? Brad, Brad Radke's was as good as it gets. and. People hit it and foul it off. Like, Johan threw it, and I, I got to face him one night, and he actually told me what he was going to do to me. <laughs> like, he's like, Dougie, I'm going fastball, change up, and if you foul off the change up, I'm throwing another one. And I did, fastball, change up, change up, go sit down, Doug, and I was just like <laughs> shaking my head. Like, no wonder you dominated for so long. These, it was like a Bugs Bunny. And I could hit off speed pitch because it was my bat speed. So <laughs> I was like, I couldn't believe it. But I, going back to that, we take Johan. You know, we protected him. I thought really, really well. We kept him on. We we, we did we did by, right by him. I just felt uh, maybe he could have. They people think he didn't do it long enough, but I mean, he would spot start and not get on the mound for nine, ten days, and then punch out thirteen against the White Sox in like six, in like five and two thirds. And you're like, the White Sox could flat out rake mm-hmm. back in the day. Maglio, Carlos Lee, Big <laughs> Frank. I mean, Canerco. Those guys absolutely wore out lefties and. This guy just went in. I mean, it was like we just could sit Indian style. We had to catch an occasional pop up, but that was it. And I, to me, for him not to be a, but at the end of the day, where do you draw the line on the Hall of Fame? You know, it, it, it's you, you can't let everybody in because now you listen to TV, everybody's a Hall of Famer and other sports. But to me, you look at in your during your time there, were you dominant? 
And how long did you do it? So the only question I have is would be I can see what you're saying, but to fall off the ballot is just it's it's a crime. Yeah, like I, I kind of look at the Hall of Fame where it's 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 the whole piece of a career, but it's also peaks. Like I, I think when you look at some guys that don't have, you know, five hundred home runs, three thousand hits, three thousand strikeouts, three hundred wins, you can look at a peak as a seven year period as any player's peak is going to be roughly seven years. And you could put Johan Santana's peak up against some of the guys that are in the Hall of Fame, and he'll either match or better a lot of those pitchers. That's a, I agreed a thousand percent. You look at their window of dominance, and were they in the top 0.01% of their profession? The answer to that question, you check it off. Absolutely yes. Yeah. So that's a... Uh... That yeah, I I I think it's you know the the more that we get advanced statistics, there are are more accurate ways to evaluate and measure a player's season or their entire careers. I think we'll look back on Johan Santana's case and be like, yeah, I think we we probably fucked that one up. But you uh you played in seven different organizations and were on four different playoff teams, so you have the experience of kind of. You see how other organizations work and you've seen different groups in different clubhouses that have had postseason success. If if you're following baseball to any degree right now, what what's your take on why a team like the San Diego Padres could have all the talent in the world? but not be able to put it all together? Like, what is the secret ingredient? Because if if that type of talent doesn't yield a postseason appearance, then what what's the missing factor? I, I kind of equate that to, and Dallas could probably chime in on this too. You look at like the teams that, the Yankee teams that won the four, whatever, the four consecutive, 90, 96 or four out of whatever, five, what it was, 96, 98, 99, 2000, even 2001 when they got walked off. They weren't the best player at each position. And you arguably can go from 2002 past that and think individually that team was better than the teams that won the championships. Um, I look at uh, our 04 team in Boston. If you go position for position, I mean, you're looking at like, I love my guys in Boston. Trust me. Billy Miller, I think, is the, was the most underrated player to ever put spikes on. Um, but if you go position for position, are you taking A-Rod or Billy Miller? Are you taking Derek Jeter or Orlando Cabrera? You go down the list and you're, the lineup was like the, the names were better, but sometimes ego gets in the way. You just don't know. Um, you're also dealing with, you know, the Dodgers who like the Padres to me, they, they amp up for LA, but then the fall against everybody else is greater than the, the uptick against the Dodgers. To win the playoffs, you really have to, you have to beat the, the teams that are 500 or below and play 500 ball against winning teams, and you'll be there every year. And I think there's something to be said, there's the highs and the lows. You get too many, you know, you get too many guys in there with maybe egos, maybe whatever. I felt like when they got Bob Melvin, I thought, okay, we're good, right? He's been around. He, he knows how to handle, you know, personalities, and it's just something doesn't work. Pitching, still the same? I don't know. I, it's, it's one of those head scratchers to me. I mean, look at the Mets at the beginning of the year. You can't tell me in, the, in your right, right mind when you can throw out Scherzer and Verlander one, two, with I don't care what you have behind them. You're thinking, okay, this is a playoff team. And sometimes, you know, it, people throw around the word chemistry. I know Piazza hated it, but there's a, there's something to be said about that. Behind it's closed real. doors, you're, it's real. It, it's something you can't you can't put your finger on it, but you can feel it. And when you get a team to believe that they can do something, it doesn't matter what the name on the back says. That unit, that core just grinds and they keep – look at the Astros. Those guys just grind out at bats. You look in the postseason when they had the shift, they were willing to let down their pride, hit a ball to the right side. They weren't forcing it, but they were hitting it where they weren't. And those little key hits add up in October and they add up throughout the course of the season. If you let your pride down and work for us instead of you, good things happen. There, and there, there, is, there, is no, there is no quantifying that. And in my opinion – that's something that front offices continue to chase and they continue to try to find an algorithm or try to find some sort of numerical framework to put it in and you just can't. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from is you have to, at some point, relinquish the power to the scouts and what they're telling you to let you know that, hey, this guy 
fits what we're trying to do here, not only because of his skill set, but because he's that guy. He's the clubhouse dude. He's somebody who knows and will play this game based on his role that day or whatever's needed from him over the entirety of this run. He's not going to come in here and try to be somebody he's not. Well, how do you know that? Uh, well, the numbers don't reflect that. Well, yeah, yeah. It's because you mm-hmm. can't reflect that with numbers. Mm-hmm. It's because you need to trust the ability for this person and this group to gel. And over the course of an entire season, you see guys step up for other guys who have to step back. And when you're able to do that over 162 and then you get into October, the question of whether or not that individual or these individuals can do that or will be willing to do that has been answered long ago in July and August when you were dragging ass and they stepped up and carried your pail of water. That question has been answered. So there's no, there's no doubt in my mind of how much that plays a role into being successful in, in, in postseason. It just, it matters. It for every, matters. for every, for every superstar, you need three wedge breakers. The mm-hmm. wedge breakers on the on the kickoff team. Yep. You need you know you need someone to kind of go in there and do the dirty work. It's like all right, I got you, I got you, I'll take care of that. You just yep. you know just drive me in. You know I always say I've always said this a lot uh, forever. If you take what the game gives you, you'll never be wrong. Oh. And and it, it, if you live by that, good things happen. And 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 over you know it's just and like and people want to talk about. I had this argument in several organizations I worked for as a coach and as a manager. Like they're quantifying like. You know, we, we got to score more runs. We got to hit more triples with men on base. I'm like, well, yeah. You know what? I mean, I wish I had a, a, a bigger piece of below the waist, but I gotta, I gotta work with what I got. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you're not gonna beat Justin Verlander seven to one in October. It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna bang five homers off of him. You better have someone when that guy gets to third base. You better have someone that can nut up and and find a way to get his ass home. If without that, you're not gonna live like that. So you know, everybody wants to. I go, I go, I. 3,000 major get bats never went to the plate going, I want to hit a triple here. It just doesn't happen. So, you know, <laughs> you, you fight those guys and you, you just try to explain them like, look, you know what? I understand what you're doing, but I've never seen a sheet of paper fix a kid. You know, the added question they always give you, right? Triple A manager. Is he ready? I don't know. Don't know. I, I don't know what he's going to do when the third deck hits and he's facing his idol who he has posters all over his wall. I do know that he's mastered the level he's at. And there's only one more to go. To meet it, because how many times? Oh, he's not. He wasn't ready. I'm like, well, yeah. You know what? He had. He probably had shit rolling down his leg because he was freaking out. So that I can't. I can't find out what's in there when the time happens. I do know he's mastered here, and he's got to. You got to give him a shot. And no offense, in some of the places I was, I have been. The guy you're throwing out there, this guy isn't going to do any worse than that. So give him a shot. Just let him try. <laughs> it's fair. <laughs> We interrupt this interview with Doug Minkiewicz for a quick word from our sponsor. Even under the bright lights of the playoffs, Blue Moon Belgian White Belgian Style Wheat Ale is the beer that's made brighter. Blue Moon was born in a ballpark for baseball fans, first brewed at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. From its bold, refreshing flavor to its beautiful, bright color, Blue Moon is as iconic as America's pastime. The BID crew will be heading down to Atlanta next weekend for games one and two of the NLDS, and I know we'll be sharing some Blue Moons down there. I mean, Dallas, Jared, Joey, Jay Hay, Braves, playoff baseball, perfect time to have some moons flying around. With its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian White Belgian Style Wheat Ale is a -a one-of-a-kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full-flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Blue Moon was brewed by baseball, so it's the perfect match for the playoffs. The crack of a beer, the pour, the first sip of that bold flavor, Blue Moon always feels like a special occasion. Best served with its signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful bright color. A beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon but you can enjoy it all through the playoffs. Brighten up the baseball playoffs with Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale. It's one of a kind every time. Check out shop.bluemoonbrewingcompany.com for fresh baseball merch and visit get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket to find Blue Moon delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash rocket. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly Blue Moon Brewing Company Golden Colorado Ale. We mentioned the... uh the four playoff teams that you've played for uh, in your experience in the postseason, did you ever look over at a teammate or maybe you're out on the base paths and you're looking at someone across the diamond, uh, an opposing player where you could tell that the environment was directly having a negative impact on their play? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I equate this to, 
this is just I, I go back to I got traded from Minnesota to Boston. In but the day I left, I looked at Ron Gardenhire and I said, "You don't, you aren't going to miss me now. When you roll into Yankee Stadium in Game One, you're really going to miss me because <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to do any. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm going to be the guy that changes the game, but I do know one thing: the environment Honestly. is not going to scare me. It's not going to affect me. I love that shit. I used to rip ice or yell back and forth to the fans, have a good time with it. What are you going to do? You can either let it, you can literally eat at you, but like that's that's what the game is all about. That's what I mean. Hell, give me those. Like, don't give me that April game and when it's freezing outside and there's twelve people. Give me Yankee old Yankee Stadium, sixty five thousand going nuts. You know who's your daddy? You know what I mean? Like where you can feel their breath. Like that's living. Like that's that's what that's what that's when we feel alive. And you can totally tell whether it's a I'll go even better. Lineups can do that to people too. The name on the back of their jersey. I would. I remember playing for the Yankees. We would see young guys come in and they would nibble. And nibble, and I'm like, and we'd look and joke around, like this kid's got to make it because he's trying to throw the perfect pitch. And like, you look up, and eight runs later, the kid's going back on the bus back to AAA. But the guy that the kid that caught our attention was the young guy came up and said, "I don't give a damn who you are. Here, hit this hater. Go ahead." And then when the guys that attacked us, you're like, "Okay, you got our attention now." And like, when you're not afraid, I always I used to tell my players all the time, hitters and pitchers are like dogs. If a dog runs at you and you run away, the dog's going to bite the shit out of you. If you look like you're going to kick the dog and stand there and stand your ground, he'll run from the fight. And if there's only one way to do that, when you're 60 feet, six inches from somebody, don't back, don't, don't back down from the fight. Attack his ass. He might get you. Tip your cap. Come back and say David Ortiz's best line. You got me now. I'm coming back up three more times. Now it's my turn. So like that, that type of interaction, some guys have it. Some guys don't. And to me, the industry is building those guys to dive after 90 pitches because they're bred that way. And I don't blame the players. I don't blame the players for this debacle of a product that's on the field right now. It's the industry has allowed these guys and molded them and their players give the industry what they want. And that's my biggest argument. This is getting long and involved. No, but, no, no. Like, that's the, Doug, like, that is keep going. I mean, like, okay, and people, we get in the arguments on social media, and we all do, right? It's like, because we stand for the product we, we were once we're in, and we knew how hard it was for us to get there. And people are like, well, he hits more homers than you. Well, you know what? If I had a chance to strike out 200 times, mm. and it wasn't a negative, mm. you think I'd hit more balls over the, over the street and over the fence? Yes. Mm. But I, I take pride that I never struck out 100 times in a big league season. And I, I didn't have a choice. I didn't hit home runs, so I damn sure couldn't punch out. It was a different game. So when people get on players, I don't get on players. They're doing what the industry wants them to do. Throw hard. Don't care if they develop it. Here, because coming up, you had to develop three pitches, hold runners, field your position, all the above. Now it's like, here, man, I think I got fired from the Tigers because I literally was like, no, he's not, he's not ready for the big leagues. He can't hold a runner. And it's like, well, he can't command a secondary pitch. And it was my, the fact that I have a, I have a a pride factor to let some of these guys, how they go about their business, go into the fraternity that's called Major League Baseball. They haven't earned it yet. And that's, I think, caused some people to to, rub the wrong way. Imagine that. But Hmm. that's the whole idea of this thing is like, you know what? You're giving the players are given freedom to do what they're asked to do. So we don't know if, if if the rules were different. I always said this. If you really want to see a change in the game, you should have paid David Eckstein fifteen million dollars or Billy Miller twenty, because no one wants them from April to uh, September. But everybody loves them in October when the games actually matter. Those guys will not; they'll win you games because they won't lose them for you. And if you start changing the dynamic of who you pay, the game will change. I promise you. Yeah. I have been preaching this exact. I mean, I've been saying that for I don't know how long. Compensation. It's compensation. We just had the conversation about Josh Hader, right? Closer Padres. Why why is he not in the ballgame? And I said, because they told him when it came time to hand out money what they valued, and it was the save. So if you want me going four outs, eh, I don't know about that. I'm probably going to steer myself in the direction of those three out saves because that's what gets me paid. And Correct. we just saw George Kirby, you know, the the conversation about, hey, I, you know, pitch count. I don't know that I should have been out there for the seven. To your point again, you can get mad and angry at the player if you want. But it's the player having already made the adjustment like players do at this level 
to how they're being compensated and to what the game is giving them, to your point that you made earlier. So they're looking at what the game is giving them, which is rewarding uh, the velocity, which is creating opportunities for them. Pitchability, not so much, not really a priority. The, the bat to ball, not really a priority. Power, a priority. Power, getting me paid. So what do you think you're going to watch these kids do when they come up? Try to provide power. Try to provide production via power so that they can get paid. I need to throw hard so I get the opportunity so I can continue to move levels because whether or not I can pitch is a secondary priority now. It's all about do I have the ability to potentially outstuff somebody in or around the strike zone because in the strike zone, man, it's around though and it's hard. So let's take a look. Yep, I always say that. Like the game will basically tell you what it needs, and those guys, like I I said every every time, like like velocity, yes, and I the game is about what it's about adjustments. We're making it easier for kids not to adjust. The pitchers have adjusted to right the high fastball. Remember, everything was everything was east and west, right? Everything was east and west. Sink, cut, hide barrels, da da, back foot sliders. Now everything's north south right everything's elevated fastball you know change the eye level boom Hot, keep chasing velocity well to me hitters haven't adjusted back to what the pitchers are doing like pitchers are ahead of hitters well you know what like we haven't really done a good job as hitters making them adjust back to us we're just mm-hmm. keep letting them be one-dimensional i always joke around with my players you know at, at, at every level high school all the way to AAA, the big league guys i work with it's like do you want to be the hot chick in a horror flick you know the hot chick that like here's a noise in the bushes Runs right over to the bush, gets axed in the first twelve seconds of the movie, right? And you never see her. You never see her again. Like, stop being the hot chicken horror flick. Like, you're doing the same shit over and over again, expect a different outcome. You're the definition of insanity. You are Carmen Electra in Scream. Like, you keep going to the bush and you're getting whacked. Stop getting whacked. Stand up there a little bit and fight. It's incredible. Love that. <laughs> um, like the uh the George Kirby stuff. That that obviously made waves for a few days, and and we saw guys like like Mark Mulder and our boy Weave came out and was tweeting stuff, not necessarily asking what you would have tweeted or like what your public reaction. I commented would. on it. Well, I, I want to know if you were in in the clubhouse, like as as a teammate of his, are you taking it upon yourself to approach him? Like, let's say. Let's say you're 35 um, and he's what, 23, whatever. So like you've got you've got like 10 years on him, roughly. Uh, Is that a situation where you take it upon yourself to approach him or you just feel some type of way privately? Okay, you're calling him over. (laughs) Come here, man. Come here. And that's and 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 just go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. Just give him just give him the just give him the the entire because don't get me wrong. We all did stupid stuff when we were 23, 24. We, I said things that I wish I could take back, um, heat of the moment type stuff. Um, you know, but I was lucky to be around Latroy, Eddie Gordado, guys at Bob Wells, Terry Steinbach, Rick Aguilera. You know, I, I was around those guys and they, they would kind of help me and kind of bring me down and be like, hey, look, I understand what you're saying. I understand it from the other side. You just threw our manager under the bus. We're in a playoff race and you made it about you. It's about us. You want to have this talk? You're upset? I just leave it alone. Say, I just, you know what? I, I just, I, you know, I ran out of gas. Whatever it is. The honesty never get, goes, goes awry in this stuff. Just like, look, I understand. Go have a talk with service in the, the next day. Absolutely. That's what, that's what the best part about being a manager is having those interactions with players to help them create you know, some experience when it happens again. We'll talk about it. Um, and you hear the good and the bad. But to do it like that, I don't think he meant it maliciously. I just think it's like, but from the way like a veteran type player is going to be like, hang on a second. Like, Mm -hmm. come here, man. Like, Mm -hmm. understand that you at 70%, there are times this game asks you to do things that are that maybe aren't in your favor, but you at least got to try. Like, what about the pen that's been throwing God knows how many innings and they're all hurting? And that's like, hey, I always had the adage of, I don't, I think 03, we all were banged up. Shannon Stewart, Tory, Jock Jones, my wrist, AJ's knees. I was like, we would rip the lineup off the wall when Guardy would put it up and we weren't in it. We're like, Guardy, try it again. 
I can't look at Tory and tell him my wrist hurts more than his hammy does or whatever it was. Like, understand that me out there at 70% might not be the best option, but I have to aim. Like, my boys are going out there. So am I. Like, I, I've got this. I, we're not going, I'm not, you know, storming a beachfront here. I'm playing a game of baseball. They deserve me to go out there. And that's kind of how I want, like, you want those guys to feel that way. Cause what happens in October that you're on that pitch count and all of a sudden, oh, now you want to be in the game, but you can't have it both ways. And then they could come get you too soon. I think more pitches are upset when the guy comes to get you. Like, what are you doing here? You think mm-hmm. Blake Snell would still want to be out there in the, in the World Series game? He'd still when be the, pitching. Right. When the analytics said he shouldn't, they won, like, the Dodgers won the World Series the second he made that move. They, were, they breathed a sigh of relief. Thank God he's out of there. The next guy they could have brought in, it could not it, it could have brought in a unicorn. They were going to score runs. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I just think there's a, there's a time and a place, and that's where veteran leadership, which Dow, Dallas talked about earlier, you can't quantify that on a piece of paper. So that stuff is invaluable. Guys like and- the Troy Hawkins, man, like th- those guys – are, are are worth their weight in gold if they don't mm. get an out throughout the course of a season. Mm-hmm. Former mm. teammate of mine as well, Dallas. Yeah, uh, yeah, Latroy. Yeah, I mean, you guys took the L, no problem. That's right. Uh, but th- yeah, th- th- I, that is exactly <laughs> that is exactly what I said. Was I, I? I said the minute that I saw that, I said there's going to be a veteran or two that takes George Kirby aside and explains to him how to go about this, so that next time should this happen. He's going to have a much better answer. Even a position player, just a position. Yep. It doesn't have to be a. It doesn't have to be a grizzly old veteran. It, doesn't, it could be a, a, an everyday guy going, "Look, explain this to you." Like, because I think that there's times when we get up there, we don't realize. I never, like, I never realized how hard it was to be a pitcher going up to the system. We always talk about, "Oh, you guys have it great. You throw 100 pitches and you go play golf for four days." But like the actual going out there every day, like, like. They, and there's uh, ways the other way too. I remember getting drilled all the time and being like, "Are y'all gonna? Someone gonna pick me up here? Is someone gonna drill a guy <laughs> for me?" And, I, and, I, and, and Latroy was like, "You know where the mound is? Go get him! If, I, I promise you, when you go, we'll be right behind you. But to have me do your dirty work? No, no, no. <laughs> Just because he hit you, if we don't, if we don't think it's right, trust me, we'll take care of it. But you got a problem with it? The mound's right there. Go get him, and we'll be right behind you, buddy. And like, just it goes both ways. Just having." The sense of us instead of me, because uh, the me feel is just a it's a bad feel, especially in September when you're fighting for a playoff berth. Um, I normally, I mean, as you know, I'm a Red Sox fan. Uh, I am not going to. I feel like anytime you do an interview, you're gonna get asked <laughs> about the World Series ball. We're gonna not do that. Uh, we're not gonna talk I don't about think 04. Time. Yeah, yeah. Like you always get asked about 04. We're not gonna talk about 04. But there is another topic that always comes up when you do interviews, and that would be Alex Rodriguez. And norm if Dallas wasn't here, I don't think that I would ask you about A-Rod. It'd be like, you know, Doug McCavich gets asked about the 04 ball and A-Rod every time he does interviews. But it's a special set of circumstances because Dallas is also an old friend of A-Rod. They got they go way back. And I was just curious uh, where you were, if you saw it live, what your reaction was to Dallas's uh, get off my mound incident with uh, your old friend, A-Rod. I loved it. <laughs> I, I, I never had a problem with competition. I don't have a problem with that. I don't. But I, I like, you know, with me and I, just clear things up with Alex, like, like, my, the whole gist of what was said on uh, Foul Territory and AJ's podcast was just like, like I joked around. It was like, it was more of a J-Lo should be running for president because if she can fix his image, <laughs> she can fix world hunger. She can fix, <laughs> like, there won't be a pothole we run over. She'll fix everything, <laughs> right? So, and like, and I joked around too. Like, if Alex had, if Alex looked at my bank account, he would jump off a bridge because he'd be like, what the hell just happened? So, uh, but like, it's just, he does. He does. He does some things that. And, I, I, and trust me, I've stuck up for him for so long. Um, always have. And I do. I do. I like kind of what was like how I went about it. Even to this day, I'm not proud of that because I, I I don't believe in talking smack to teammate about teammates. But it was more of like the industry kind of. It's kind of funny how these players today can write a tweet. When they were, you brought up Hater. What was it? Two years ago, Hater was talking about some tweet he had in high school. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you're going to jump him at the All Star game, but some of these guys that are all over TV and all over the sport they cover, they've done like, alongside, they literally have committed like 
the most cardinal sin and they're being, you know, hired and loved and but yet you can't say this and you can't say that. So as far as what happened with him in Dallas, like that's I love that. Like that's <laughs> you know, I hit the ball that Alex screamed, what I got it. Oh, yeah. Third. Yeah. You know, I didn't care for that, but hey, you know what? We were in a playoff push and it wasn't, you know, you know, in my opinion, like it was it do I think it was kind of bush? Yeah. But on my team, I want you to do whatever you have to do to win. And two, honestly, if you're an infielder and you don't you you can't decipher between I got it and you got it, come on, man. Like stop. Like don't don't pass the buck. You drop the pop up, keep your chin up. Like <laughs> hang with them. Hang with them. <laughs> Cold world. Cold it's, 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 yeah. Hey, it's eat or be eaten, baby. It's, it's the, the jungle out here. The, my, my, only, my only issue with the with the A Rod thing was how close in proximity he was to me and the mound at that time. It's not like I was 15 feet away and he was just kind of moseying on over the path of least resistance. He, he literally had to climb up a hill so he could walk where he walked as close to me as he did. So it will always and forever remain. Fuck him from my name. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I trust me. I play with AJ. So like, AJ would run across the mountain all the time. And I'm like, AJ, will you quit as a team? I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like he doesn't need more to get fuel drilled or ask you to get one like, of you drilled. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, he's like, what, what I do? I'm like, AJ, you just ran across the mountain. <laughs> like, well, don't do that. But he, but honestly, AJ just was like, da, da, da. like, uh, Point A, point B, okay. I'm like, and then he'd do the thing at first where he'd dive into the bag and like, you know, bump you. And they bump me. And I'm like, look, man, we're not teammates anymore. Cut that shit out. Like, <laughs> I don't like that. But that's just the way. I mean, I, I just think they try to do, like, I think Alex always tried to do the team thing, you know, be this. He tried to be somebody he wasn't in New York, right? Early, because he, you know, he wanted to be part of the, 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 the Brat Pack so bad, the Yank Pack, the Core four so bad that he was willing to do whatever he had to do, and he I, I, he wanted to be the villain, but he realized he couldn't handle it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like I feel like that that was one of the quotes that you had, where wh- wh- whoever it was, Posada, saying like, you know, where have you been? Like you're like you were just able to check him in a way that that other people couldn't. Um, which I th- I found that to be very interesting, and I think it all goes back to being high school teammates. It's like I knew you before you were this a list celebrity. So I can check you in a way that other people are afraid to because they see you as the A-list celebrity. I see you as Alex from, you know, high school. <laughs> and that's and that's kind of like and I, and the year we were together in 07, um, he was more Alex that I knew than probably any other year. Um, and that's like that's like even through today. And I know he probably hates my guts and, you know, I feel bad for his family for, you know, getting mad at me, whatever. But like that's my that was always my biggest beef. I go, people really saw the real Alex that we knew that would joke and make fun of himself and humble and just kind of do some things like just comedy. Like he's real, but like he's been, and I always said this and I still believe this, he's been institutionalized, right? He's been told what to say, when to say it, how to say it since he was 13 years old. So, you know, it goes back to the, you blame the players or you blame the industry. Well, it's like, you know, I get it. I, 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 that's why I, I, even through all of this, even if he hates my guts, you know what? I called him out for some things, and I'm I'm over it and done with it. But I'm like, I, I still, I I still, we all miss the guy that we knew. And Dougie, I'll tell you this: I have always, always said that part of the anger, I think, and the frustration comes from knowing what if he would have just not behaved the way he did, and he could have been a. I don't know. He, he he could have been somebody that folks maybe didn't gravitate towards. He could have had an attitude and an ego. And if he would have just not done some of the things that he's done, what he could really do for our game in terms of expanding it, in terms of bringing positive attention to it, what he could do for the game, it, that that's what I it angers me, is it feels like we're being robbed of what could be a great ambassador, what could have been a great ambassador because I, I, you know, I mean, look, you're fucking suing the union. You're suing the, like, there's just some, there's just some things that you gotta, <laughs> you, you know, you gotta put aside, maybe don't get over, but you gotta put aside to allow the coexistence to occur. But that's and where it's not even, Hey, go ahead. You're absolutely, you're, uh, you hit the nail on the head for sure. And that's that stuff. But then again, it goes back to like everybody, I'm all for second chances and like, in and lack of a better term, like I'm proud of him for like, everybody kind of forget some of that stuff because of, 
who he is now. But I just think like he was magical when we were young. I mean, magical high school. Like it was, I mean, it was just ridiculous. And to see him elevate and keep going, like you're talking, like it's a shame that the other stuff got in the way of us mentioning him as probably the best player to ever put spikes on. Him and Barry to me are the best two players to ever grab a bat that I got to witness and I got to see and I got to play against. They were the best two I've ever seen. Fair. Well, you mentioned us. You mentioned a story about playing for the Yankees. I just wanted to let you know this. Uh, in '07, I've told this story. Um, I can remember rolling into Yankee Stadium. I was in the bullpen at this time because uh, I was I had I, I won my debut and then just proceeded to get my ass handed to me. So they're like, "Buddy, if you're going to get outs, it's going to be in a fucking blowout down there." <laughs> so <clears throat> I was I was. It's like day two, and I look at our bullpen coach and I'm like, "Hey, fish." Uh, we didn't have the we didn't have the advanced meeting. We didn't have the and he goes, You know where you're at? I said, Yeah, we're in New York. He goes, You know who you're playing? I said, Yeah, the Yankees. He goes, Everybody knows who the fucking Yankees are. Kid, go get them. <laughs> and I was like, That's All right. funny you say that. <laughs> I we talked about we talked about when Paul Molitor scouted the, the A's for us in 02. Well, Tom Kelly scouted the Yankees in 03 for our first division series, and we're all excited for this advanced meeting. He walks in and he goes, Good luck, boys. Good luck. <laughs> and just walks out. We're like, Good luck. Skip, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> like, 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 basically, like, y'all got no chance. Just go ahead and set your tea times up for Friday because this shit's over. It's fucking so, over. Like, thanks, Skip. Appreciate it. <laughs> You're lucky. I just, I just looked up if you guys faced each other. I'm sure it would have been, it would have been real bad for you, Dallas. But you guys never faced each other. No, I, I no, I. By that point, I was, I was like. The funny thing is, I always joke around like. Everybody, everybody wanted me for my glove early, and then because I couldn't hit, and now like towards the end, I started playing. Sometimes and I started to realize I wasn't hitting. When I finished playing, I could hit and I couldn't feel because my arm was so jacked up. But it was like <laughs> it's just the way it was. Funny how it goes full circle. Yeah, if I was the lefty who was going to get you right though, Doug. Like, look, hey, he's got zero, <laughs> zero breaking ball, and it's eighty six. All right, if you can get the head out, it's not going to be. You're going to be just fine. Which you the, would have been just fine. The joke for me, the joke for me every spring training was like, if I hit a home run in spring training, like go ahead and look at the transactions the next day. That guy's either released, sent down, <laughs> or he's traded. So it was like, here he gets. I said after every home run, like I brought across one play, like I blacked out. What happened? Like I just like I just blacked out. And so it was. It, I, it, Joe was like, that guy. Good luck next year, buddy. You know, like, like, oh shit! Here we go. Check the transactions, boys. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> Doug Minkiewicz, thank you so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. We'll do this again soon. Absolutely, guys. Take care. All right, Had good. a blast, Doug. We'll see you. Big thanks to Doug Minkiewicz for making the time. Coming on Baseball is Dead today. Uh, we've we've been on a little bit of a heater with the guests. I'm not even going to try Ploof today. I'm not even going to try to call him. Not doing it. No. no. I don't think Why he'll answer. Why how, many how many times are you going to call a guy and he doesn't answer? He doesn't want to come yeah, on. He, he hates yeah, he's the gotta podcast. Call us now. Yeah. He fucking hates our podcast. He didn't want anything to do with Why it. Why do you think that is, Joe? Like, because he thinks he's better than the us. <laughs> he does. I mean, he's very handsome. I'll, I will say that. But Yeah, he is. And he's cool <laughs> as fuck. He but is pretty, whatever. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, He's ducking us. I don't know. I feel like he's got all these takes about the Minnesota Twins being a team that could surprise a lot of people, but the only thing that's been surprising is the fact that he doesn't want to share them publicly. That's fine. All right, we got to take a break and talk about Zinn Nicotine Pouches. We're always talking about what a team needs to get to number one, but Zinn Nicotine Pouches are already there. Zinn has helped millions of people achieve a lasting change, earning the title of America's number one nicotine pouch. If you're a smoker or you're a dipper looking to make a change, look no further than Zinn. Zinn is made with six simple ingredients and is available in a wide range of varieties, including spearmint, citrus, and even coffee. And it's available in two strengths so you can control your nicotine satisfaction. Because it's discreet, you can enjoy it anywhere, anytime, so you never have to miss a moment of the game. Plus, Every can of Zinn earns you points towards premium items like tailgating gear, top-of-the-line tech, Zinn swag, even gift cards. 
Find your Zin at your local convenience store or online at Zin.com. That's Zin, Z-Y-N.com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Were there any other stories? I mean, I feel like the <laughs> the, the Cubs... Ronnie what about, montage was like the lead story today. What? Or the fucking guy, Naris, going after our man, J-Rod. Did oh, we yeah. talk about this? That was weird. That what was happened? weird. Hector Naris struck out Julio Rodriguez and just like immediately started charging at him. Like the pitcher yeah. charged the plate. It was fucking Aggressive. weird. Aggressive. Can I see yeah. that? Where's that at? You know, Where? Everywhere. Oh, it's on the internet, bro. What? Yeah, yeah. Search Naris or Naris. Hector Naris? N-E-R-I-S. Yeah, it was very weird. Did he... Uh, was there any history? That's what I'm trying to think. I um, don't think there's any r- history between him and J-Rod specifically. There was moments... There's been, there's been kerfuffles with these two teams, you know, on and off for the past several seasons. Yeah, what's that all about, man? I'm just trying to... I'm trying to get to the bottom of this because, you know... Julio Rodriguez, not a guy that uh, a lot of people ha- seem to have any disdain for. Hey, 0-2 pitch. Swing and a miss. Neris pumped up. And he is going to say something to Julio Rodriguez on his way off the mound. He was pumped up and walked right at Julio Rodriguez. And now the benches are going to clear. I can't find the video. For this. Yeah, I'm not sure what. This seems unnecessary. You can't find it, Dallas? I'll send it to you. No, I mean, I'm typing it in, and all I'm getting is Hector Neris practicing sword fighting skills. Yeah, we know. You don't know how to use the internet. Not really <laughs> 2019. Really just learning. Like yeah, I how do you spell Neris, Dallas? Yeah. In E-R-I-S. Uh, That's right. So I just sent it to you. Sent it in the, Same. the BID group text that's always popping off with the hottest baseball clips. You watching it, Dallas? What's your yep. read on this? Yep. Oh, wow. What do you got? Walk us through it. Let's get uh, a live reaction. In- initially, initially pumped up, uh, just like like walking at him. He's pre- he probably doesn't even want to fight. He's he's not even wanting to fight. Oh, he no just way. was so jacked up that he was losing his shit. Ah, and look, Julio has been demonstrative. In in his successes, not necessarily towards anybody, but just I, he's great. Julio he's like, harmless. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah. But I mean, he's just been demonstrative. Like demonstrative doesn't mean he's been aggressive. It means he has been very emotive. You can see his excitement when he achieves something and does something cool, and it's fun to watch. People get excited about it. I I said he hasn't necessarily directed that at anybody. No. So I think when people see that. They might not like it. It might rub them the wrong way. Obviously, Neris is one of those dudes who has looked at it and said, should I get the moment to undress this dude instead of him hitting a bomb off me and fucking taking me out to the no-fly zone, to the J-Rod section? I'm going to let him know that I'm his daddy. And, well, he just took that a little too far, and he started fucking sprinting. Not sprinting, but, like, (laughs) walking aggressively towards the dude. Like, look, you fuck around and do that with the wrong dude, that bat may or may not get put down. And like Julio is a kid. He is a good dude. So he's probably not looking to knock your block off from Jump Street at the beginning of one of these types of interactions. That's where Neris gets lucky, in well, my opinion. Because he quickly especially. started to reroute and realize like, ah, you know what? That was dumb because this guy's done nothing to me. I'm probably just a little fired up here. Shit, yep, that's probably not going to look great. All right, I'll get pushed back to my dugout. Damn, I'm going to get asked about this. That was ultimately a bad look. That's probably how it all went down. Yeah, I mean, according to the reading that I'm doing about it, uh, Seattle Times reporter Adam Jude said that Eugenio Suarez said, that uh, Neris screamed an anti-gay slur or term oh. at Julio Rodriguez. Oh. Oh. So, okay. I don't really, yeah, I don't, I, it doesn't say what that is, uh, but he said he started talking bad words in Spanish. Uh, he started doing something that is not good for people who speak Spanish and understand. I was in the on-deck circle and heard that. That pissed me off. 
That's Suarez's quote. Um, yeah, and, Neris, and look, I mean, Neris referred to him as he's my friend after the game, but it, all the other stuff says Julio was really surprised by the way that it played out. So I don't. I mean, that we may not. This may not be the end of that. Um, is this the first time that that, that they you, faced each other since Julio took him deep? I don't. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that was last year. But that that that's what I'm saying. Like you know, like a guy fucking hits a homer, dresses you up, rounding the bases. You don't like it, and you remember. But he said you he's remember. His, they're friends. I know, I, the, dude. Uh, uh, I've drilled also, a buddy. Like, I drill. I drill the guy that was a former teammate of mine. Yeah, I, I have to say, well, you're a piece of shit. I, I have to more. say, if he is, <laughs> if he's doing that in response to Julio Rodriguez hitting a home run off of him last season. That is a much larger loser move than I had anticipated before we started this conversation. <laughs> Holding on to that for an entire year is loser ass shit. Are, are you calling for, putting aside the losers? Oh uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we've done, I think we did a starting nine podcast where I said exactly that. Actually, um, what did I think you we say? all had that opinion? Remember when That's Hunter so Strickland brought Hunter back Strickland a beef oh, like yeah, three yeah, years yeah. after yeah. with three Bryce years Harper? Later, against Bryce Harper, I got you yeah. now, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, that was like, I, yeah, that was such loser shit. Hunter Strickland was not long for this game after that. I don't think. Um, oh. Yeah, total douche move. Yeah. Well, um, all right. Uh, any uh, any final thoughts that you gentlemen would like to share today, Joseph? Can we um, uh, can we plan for any montages, Joe? If we tune into the Braves game. Yeah, yeah, probably because they're about to fucking break the all-time home run record. So yeah, it's just every game is a new record. Sorry, sorry, the Braves are so good that yeah, there's the, a lot of records being broken. The, the, the Braves but first can't... it was 40-40, then it was uh fucking <laughs> three hundred home runs, and it was a hundred wins, and they and they got forty seventy. Now it's gonna be the all-time home run record. Yes, that's five. What's the week. what's the modern it, run scored record? Like they should show a montage of every run that they scored this year. <laughs> I'm, I'd be awesome. That'd be a fun thing to watch. Mm-hmm. Everyone would love watching that. Dude, you like the, the Braves legitimately cannot crumble up their lineup and put together a lineup that doesn't have three dudes who've hit 30 homers or more. That's evil. That's evil what they've been doing this year. They deserve a video. Yeah. I um, need a montage. A fucking montage. I need a montage. That's how I feel about it. I feel like they they have earned their montages. Like we're not talking about uh, little rinky dink reasons to be bringing out the montages. You go forty seventy first player in baseball. I don't know how if you're aware how long baseball's been around, but the first time that someone's able to steal seventy bags and hit forty bombs, he's the first one to ever do it. Kind of a big deal. All right, now and I don't. It's crazy they didn't run a. Gonna it's crazy they didn't run a montage for forty sixty nine. You know, in forty sixty eight, that have been. I think nice that's. One. I think that restraint is actually what should be applauded. Mm. Well, well hey, never hey, we're going to see. Either. I'm. I'm that's really that's curious that's to true. see. Could you imagine what hap- what happens when forty fifty happens, and people run a montage, and then people are like, "Bro, forty fifty, really? Like forty seventy? Come on, unless it's forty eighty. Like, are we really doing like that? I. That's going to be something that happens. That will be something. You that guys, j- no, you guys just don't. Get it. I, wa- I, I wanna- don't get we are setting the precedent. You can't say you don't get in a montage for 47. That was up to the Braves. Do you get a montage for 4070? Actually, last night they decided for now on, for the rest of history, you get 4070, you get a montage. Yeah. We invented it. We we created it. <laughs> so it's like Braves and montages sorry. and Dusty Baker and the high five. There you go. Creators. Wow. Hmm. Uh, Justin Havens, do you have any final thoughts this day? Uh, yeah, of course I do. Um, shout out to it's a, it's a New York flavored uh, final thoughts today. Okay. Shout out to Francisco Lindor, who yesterday crossed the doubleheader, achieved his first career 30 30 season. Um, I know a graphic was sent out on social media. I don't know if a montage was played in the stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Aaron Judge, uh, this is kind of specific, but uh, just a way to tip our cap to another amazing season season even if it hasn't been quite what last season's was 
Uh, he now has 138 homers over his last three seasons, which span his age 29 to 31 campaigns. With one more homer, he will have the most homers from age 29 to 31 of any player in AL history. Uh, he's currently tied with Jim Tomey, um, who was with Cleveland uh, during that portion of his career with 138. Most ever is Sammy Sosa with 179. You know, kind of video game fake numbers, obviously. But um, yeah, so we'll see if Judge can do that. I'm sure that'll be very important. And then obviously, I saved the best for last. Um, Garrett Cole pretty much wrapped up the AL Cy Young last night. And when he officially wins the award, he will be the first person to win the AL Cy Young Award and cross the Baines line wow. in the same season since Jim Palmer wow. in 1976. That's a real nugget. Wow. I went and researched it. Pretty painstaking <laughs> to figure that out, actually. Um, <laughs> painstaking. But it is, that's true. First time in nearly a half century that somebody has crossed the Baines line and gone on to win the AL Cy Young Award in that same season. So, I mean, just a hearty congrats to Garrett, who we've praised on this podcast for this achievement. But, I mean, this this double dip is really something. That's a round of applause. Yeah, it is. You're more than welcome to do it. Uh, But no montage. There's going to be no montage. You know why? Because they set the precedent in 1976 that when you do that, you don't get a montage. (laughs) 1976. It's it's pretty fair, actually. I don't I don't think there was a montage that year. So exactly. And you kind of wish it's crazy, though, because it's a way fucking it's a way bigger achievement than 4070. Obviously, yeah, so don't don't you wish there. don't they wish don't you wish back then they had the foresight and took a little couple minutes to do a montage then we could celebrate Garrett Cole like he although I guess be, technically but now can't if we're being fair it's tough to do a montage because you don't get the award until November so that's true maybe there was a montage played at Jim Palmer's home <laughs> in 1976 like on a projector projection screen or whatever old timey stuff was going on in 76 was he unanimous in 76 i don't know but it was his third cy young award um he'd won in 75 also uh was he unanimous that's a great question let's find out that answer uh jim palmer no he was not uh mark fidrich received Mm. five first place votes bird the bird man uh dallas you have any final thoughts before the final weekend of the se- uh, season uh no i mean you laugh and joke about the brent rooker me looking up his stats look dude in a season where i have had to uh try to keep my eyes peeled for signs of positivity it has been a silver lining season uh for brent rooker to experience what he's experienced in his short career right 2020 you break in and then you got what do you got? You got just an absolute mess ahead of you as far as baseball goes, dealing with COVID and protocols and blah, blah, blah. But you break out of that, you get a shot as an older guy, makes his first all-star team, is knocking on the door of 30 home runs, which in a season where there hasn't been a ton of offensive productivity for a guy who has struggled to establish himself to finally have a season where he's been able to do that for the better part of what we've seen. And a great appearance on MLB Network. Tip of the cap to Brent. Everybody's talking about it. He also acknowledged Rook. me this year. Um, as he has in the past. As uh <clears throat> again, you know, you brought it up, so I you know, I have to kind of go there. Brent Rooker said that uh, <laughs> No, I didn't my bring it arm up. in the outfield I never, was, never even thought about bringing it up. If I were in the big leagues, it we wouldn't be the worst moderately arm discussed in the big leagues. Based on a throw that I made from the no right light field corner to nothing. the third baseman that hit him in the chest it's, on the fly. Happen. And he didn't said happen. not every big league outfielder can do that. And I agreed. I just mm-hmm. wanted to hear it from a big leaguer. Uh, so shout out to Brent To be oh, honest, so that sounds like that. That sounds like the B rook that I know. Yeah, yeah. He said he said it multiple times. Yeah, he did. He did. Um, he just made a catch. He just made a catch in right field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how about some Jake's takes to send us into the weekend? Uh, just shout out Brent Rooker. Quite the season. <laughs> um, I was going to say that too. So thanks, Kels. <laughs> <laughs> See? See? Doing the Lord's work. That's what happens. Synergy. When, when, you, do a, uh, when you do a Red Sox podcast together, you uh. create synergy like that. All right. That's good for you guys. Uh, all right. 
enjoy your final weekend of regular season baseball before <clears throat> the calendar turns to October and postseason uh, is here. I think, did we, there, we, do we know what the podcast schedule is going to be next week, Jake? Uh, yeah, we're doing a preview episode for um, all of the wild card series, and then we're going to see how the wild card plays out, and then we'll figure it out after that. Okay, so we're at uh, we're at the mercy of the playoff schedule. Uh, follow baseball is dead, and all of us on Twitter for updates um, for when the episodes are going to drop. But we'll keep you posted as the postseason rolls along uh, as to when the new episodes are going to drop. But there's not going to be a cutback. You're probably going to still get whatever it is, two, three episodes a week as we've been doing. Um, once we get to the World Series, that'll be when uh, I think we're doing them after every single game. So the content's only going to go up, not down. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you and, on Monday. And, and I was also going to say uh, during the uh, during the wild card games and some of the postseason games, um, I'll be, I'm going to be doing card breaks as well. So um, we've got that going on. But Jake, um, we need to go into the weekend with a uh, with a good idea of what kind of weather we're going to be facing. What's it looking like today in your neck of the woods? Uh, it's actually heating up in Boston. It's been uh, super rainy for the last couple of weeks, but uh, just as the Red Sox season ends, the rain's going to go away. So that's awesome. Um, so yeah, should Feel be it. looking nice in Boston this weekend. It's, it's good to hear. Nice and awesome is the forecast. Nice and awesome. <laughs> We out.